Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here and uh, participate in this celebration of beautiful physics. Um, in my talk, I will take this physics and combine it with anthropometer ferrometry to test atom and neutron neutrality to a very high accuracy, to a level seven orders of magnitude below current bounds. I will start by describing to you briefly how atom interferometry works. Then I will describe the experiment itself. And if I have time, I will describe how, um, uh, how you can get infinitesimally charged uh, atoms. Atom interferometry is very similar to light interferometry. In a light interferometry, you take a laser beam. With a beam split, it, you split it into two parts that take different paths. With mirrors, these beams are made to reconverge and interfere after a final beam <coughs> splitter. Similarly, atom interferometry, um, you, have, you separate an atom in space-time now. So an atom in la is launched with an initial momentum p. And at, uh, at t equals 0, you apply a beam splitter. I will explain later what that is. And you split the wave function in an equal superposition of states, one with momentum p and another with an increased momentum, p plus k. And the, the two wave packets will start getting separated in the space-time diagram. At time t, I will apply mirrors that flip the moment of these states. And the two states are made to reconverge. And after a final beam splitter, they interfere. You measure the phase, the interference, the amount of phase shift, um, by taking um, the, um, the ratio of the number of atoms you measure in the state with, mo with increased momentum, p plus k, and with momentum p. If there is any difference in the physics that the two atoms will see in their, in their two trajectories, it will appear as a phase shift. Atom interferometry turns out that this technique is a very powerful tool to test fundamental physics. One of the reasons is that the duration of the experiment is one second. And if you were to translate it in the distance that the light would travel, it would take, it would take an arm length of the Earth-Moon distance to reproduce that time. Also, the techniques used, if the laser techniques used in these experiments have demonstrated extreme accuracy, 17 orders of magnitude accuracy, in the past decade. And as you can see, they have also, in the span of less than 10 years, they have attracted three Nobel Prizes. Um, one of the reasons um, also atoms become a very sensitive tool is that it's very easy to manipulate them. You can excite their internal degrees of freedom, cool them, trap them, launch them, split their wave functions, and when and this and our last point that um, uh, it applies in test of gravity, this is a tabletop experiment which is performed under control conditions. Now, um, the beam splittings and the mirrors that I mentioned earlier are lasers. And the effect that they use is Raman transition. They take an atom and they shine two counter-propagating lasers on it. One for frequency omega one, the other for frequency omega two. This will induce, as you can see, let me see, as you can see here, a, a two photon transition between the ground state with momentum p and the excited state that will have momentum p plus k. This is the, the frequencies are such that they're slightly, slightly detuned between a third state so that you have no one photon transitions. Now, in, during this process, the atom absorbs a photon with frequency omega 1, so it takes a kick in momentum in this direction, and because of the presence of the laser with frequency omega 2, it's, it, will it will stimulate it, emit a photon also in that direction, so it will also get a kick in, that, in, in, in this direction. As a result, the effective momentum that the uh, atom gets is the sum of the momentum from the two lasers, while the, ex the, the in internal degrees of freedom are only excited by the difference. If I were to keep the laser running for a long time, I would see that the, that the atom would oscillate between the two states, the ground and the excited. And by controlling, this happens with a frequency that's called the Rabi frequency, and 
if I can control, since I can control the time, the duration of the pulse of the la uh, that I apply the lasers for, I can control very well the state that my atom will end up in. So if I start from the ground state and I apply a pulse that lasts pi over two in units of the inverse Rambi frequency, then I will end up in an equal superposition of excited and ground state. If I apply a pulse that lasts pi in units of, um, in units of the inverse Rabi frequency, I will see that I transition from the ground to the excited or vice versa. Another thing to keep in mind is that the experiment that I'll be talking about is, happens in the presence of the gravitational field of the Earth. As a result, the space-time trajectories will be curved, and this also constrains the time of the experiment, the duration of the experiment, to be roughly one second. As you can see, the fast and the slow component of the wave function get separated. They reach different heights. And uh, this is something that I will use in the experiment I will describe. The measured phase is just the difference in the actions between the fast and the slow component of the wave function. And in the presence of the gravitational field of the Earth, this is just the difference in the potential. It measures the difference in the potential that the two wave packets reach. And you can imagine that the atom interferometer is just a fancy potentiometer. The sensitivity of these experiments depends on the number of atoms you use and the time, of course, you have to repeat the experiment. If I were to do it on only one atom, I would, go, I would get no phase contrast. So, but the sensitivity improves at the, square, at the inverse square root of the, numbers, of the number of times I repeat the experiment. So if I take 10 to the 8 atoms, for each bond. every time I perform one experiment, um, I launch them, do my interferometry, and then I repeat this by 10 to the 6 times. I will find that the phase shift is the, that I can measure, the smallest phase shift that I can measure, is 10 to the minus 7 rad. If I were to use entangled atoms, and this is at what they call Heisenberg statistics, I would uh, improve this phase shift, this uh, sensitivity, by at least one order of magnitude. And this is something that will be done very soon at Stanford. This is an experiment that's been built in the basement of the physics department uh, uh, at Stanford University. And the first thing it will do, it will test the equivalence principle. They will take at the, at the bottom of the experiment, at the bottom of the experiment, they will cool at below temperatures of microkelvin. Um, isotopes of rubidium, or rubidium-87 or rubidium-85. They will latch them vertically in the gravitational field of the Earth, and they will measure the, the acceleration by which they fall. They will do this initially with an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 15. This is already a factor of 300 better the, compared to current experiments that involve lunar laser ranging, and there is also an experiment at um, Washington University in Seattle. Um, and now to talk about the experiment, but before I do, I would like to talk to you a bit about what does it mean to have a, a charged atom. So it's related to charge quantization. Why, so in the standard model of particle physics as we know it, as we know it, it arises as a mystery. Why does the charge of a composite particle is, why is the charge of a composite particle equal and opposite to a charge of an elementary particle like the electron. And we also find that their charges are related with very specific relations. This mystery is automatically solved when you embed the standard model in a grand unified theory. There, charge quantization arises very, exactly the same way as angular momentum quantization arises in quantum mechanics through commutation <coughs> relations. But even in that case, Witten showed that you shouldn't take charge quantization for granted. And the reason is that grand unified theories predict the existence of monopoles. And in the presence of monopoles, the, mag the magnetic field is no longer divergentless. So when I write, when I have magnetic monopoles, and I write the CP violating term, what we call a theta term, theta times E dot B, the electric times the magnetic field, this term is no longer a boundary term in the Lagrangian, no longer a full derivative in the Lagrangian. So it will affect the kinematic equations. And as you can see, it, now we find that there will be, in the presence of magnetic monopoles, an electric field. 
source, but the magnetic charge density that's proportional to the theta angle, the, CP the amount of CP violation. And that amount of CP violation has no reason to be quantized. Now we'll come back to that later if I have time. The theory I will describe that um, uh, talks about infinitesimally charged atoms is based on this. But let's talk about the experiment right now. So as I alluded before, we'll take rubidium atoms, we lash them vertically in the gravitational field of the Earth. They are wave functions are split by the momentum splitting. And for certain values of the momentum splitting they can give, they can stay separated by a meter for about a second. And then they come back down and, uh, and interfere. So if I introduce, I take advantage of this macroscopic separation and introduce a voltage in the trajectory of the first component of the atoms. If I do that, the electrical Haronov bomb effect, and if the atom has a tiny charge epsilon compared to the uh, electron, the electrical Haronov bomb effect tells me there will be a phase shift that's proportional to the atom's charge times the voltage applied times the time by which I, for which I applied. This experiment, given the sensitivity, um, will be sensitive to a charge per nucleon that's at the level of one part in 10 to the minus to 10 to the 30 compared to the charge of the electron. Current bounds are eight orders of magnitude above. So of course there is no experiment free of systematics. And so in this picture I see again the space-time diagram of the fast and slow component of the atoms. This is the fast and this is the slow component. With dark gray and light gray, I, sh I show the regions <coughs> where I apply a voltage V and minus V, the fast and the slow component respectively. I will explain later why that is. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that even though the atoms are free falling and they're not subject to seismic noise, for example, the laser is attached to the Earth. And the laser, through its phase and its interaction with the atom, will imprint laser phase noise at the atom. So as a result, I will have to, to, to run two interferometers at the same time. Also, the, uh, there will be strong electric fields at the entrance of the tube. Of course, the atoms have no charge, but they can still get polarized, and there will be a force on them. But if I turn on the voltage when the atoms are well inside the tube, I can suppress this effect by a lot. Also, I can do the same for the lower component, add another tube to get the same exponential screening effect. But when I turn on the voltage, I will, use, I will induce transient magnetic fields. These, because of symmetry, I can arrange the charging to be such because of, and suppress them because of symmetry, but even if I don't do it perfectly, the phase shift that I will measure depends on a certain way on the voltage and on parameter, control parameters of the experiment. So I can isolate it for any, from any other phase shifts that would naively spoil the effect. And, and for neutral neutrality, all I have to do <coughs> is take two isotopes. A one rubidium 87, rubidium 85, launch them together. Now the experiment will be sensitive since I, have to sub I will subtract the phase shift between the two isotopes. It will be sensitive to the charge of the two neutrons, which is the charge difference between the, the two um, isotopes. And um, this, uh, this, uh, this experiment will be able to measure um, the, the neutron charge to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 28 one part in 10 to the 28. Current bound to several orders of magnitude above. Um, so I still have time. So the question is, what will we be able to test? Is there a reason to believe that we will see anything uh, with these experiments? And as I alluded to before, we know, I will generalize, we know that in ordinary in the gut theories as we know them, if I have magnetic monopoles, they would acquire a non-quantized charge due to CP violation. Now let's imagine that somehow my elementary particles, electrons, neutrons, uh, electrons quarks, neutrinos, um, are, have a magnetic charge 
under a field B prime, and this field couples to electromagnetism through a needle B coupling. Then there will be a charge shift. Um, there will be a charge shift for ordinary particles that's proportional to the to the coupling between um, E and M in that field, and how much charge they have. These charges. Um, and this is based on the talk that Gia Dvali gave a couple of days ago, uh, can arise from Calbramon fields. These fields are anti-symmetric two tensor fields. You can define for them a field strength, same way you define a field strength for a vector field. And there is a gauge symmetry associated with them, same way that the gauge symmetry is associated uh, w by which the, uh, the same way gauge symmetry is associated with a vector field. Um, Many people have worked with this, uh, um, and uh, they found that black holes can carry um, magnetic charge, can have, create Calbramon field configurations that look like they carry a magnetic charge, for which the field strength is zero. Nevertheless, there is no way to globally gauge away these configurations, so this can have a physical effect. They've also shown that this effect persists when the Calbramon field is massive. And the interesting thing is that they pointed out that there will be the analog of the Aharonov bomb effect for strings. So if I take a black hole, take it through a string, there will be a phase shift imprinted on the system that's proportional to the amount of, of flux, of Calbramon flux that the, magnet the string has engulfed. So if I assume now, since we have no black holes in labs, no cosmic strings, now if I, I have to assume that since ordinary particles are constituents of black holes, I can assume that ordinary particles carry this Calbramon charge. And if this Cal, now if this Calbramon field has a non-trivial coupling to ENM, then there will be an elementary, a non-trivial charge shift of these particles. So and there is no reason for this charge shift to be quantized. As a result, the <coughs> atoms will appear to have a charge. So to conclude, atom interferometry provides a powerful to tool, a very sensitive tool to test fundamental physics. And if I combine it with the topological nature of the Haronov bomb effect, I can very easily suppress the systematics <coughs> and get a very high sensitivity giving me eight, at least seven orders of magnitude improvement in current test of charge quantization. Uh, the, interesting, the other thing is that this experiment could possibly test phase charge shifts that could be related to the string version of the Aharonov bomb effect. Um, and I will refer you to the talk by, um, by Gia uh, two days ago. Of course, there are other theoretical um, uh, possibilities that I haven't referred to in this talk, you're free to ask me afterwards. So thank you very much. <laughs> yes? Uh, on the, uh, you know, I, I, I sit in a lab at NIST where there's a lot of atom stuff going on. Yes. I'm a neutron guy, so I'll prefer yes. neutrons yes. as possible. Uh, there, there's measurements like this shawl group. Yeah. On the magnetic on limits on the magnetic monopole of the neutron. Magnetic monopole of the neutron. I think it has. Ah, okay. What's that uh, limit? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, see, there is a tricky part. There is no force associated with this magnetic charge. So uh, there is no there is no force associated with the charge, because I mean, no, it doesn't apply. We can talk about it later, but it doesn't apply to this case. <laughs> 